Okay. So uh, today, um, let's hear, it's Monday, uh, we're on topic nine, we have topic 10 left um, after this one. So that's gonna go over tomorrow, which is gonna be more about web scraping. Um, for the record, these two uh, topics aren't necessary for the project coming forward, but they're definitely like useful things to know how to do like as a data scientist to collect more data, basically to acquire more data. Um, API, like understanding how to do APIs, other data structure formats and you know, web scraping can be really useful. Um, but I would say like one thing, like don't stress out and like, oh, there's so much going on, you know, like for web, especially web scraping. I think that's where people get like, oh, that's a lot of work. Um, don't worry that the project will not like necessarily entail all of those parts. Um, if anything, it's going to be more a little bit of like, we're going to give you essentially a SQL database and you can kind of query that database. Um, and that's going to be relatively um, like, a, like the initial part of getting the data and then actually like analyzing it and stuff like this with like pandas and stuff. Um, so we'll talk more actually about the project on Wednesday. We'll actually introduce the project. So if you guys are going to miss any day, like don't miss Wednesday, um, you know, I'll still record it, of course, but that's where you guys can ask me all the questions and like really probe me about like, you know, how's this project work? How's the assessments work? And then on Friday, we'll continue that as well. Um, on Wednesday, I should note too, is that I'm going to introduce the project. And if we have time, I'm going to show you a little bit of how to maybe set up your repo for the project. And remember the reason why I say this is because um, I think of your project as being more how does this, um, like a portfolio project, like something that you want to show to an interviewer, a recruiter, hiring manager, um, kind of evidence of what you're, you've done. So um, we'll talk about like what's how to make that neat and how that make it nice and tidy. Okay, sound good. Um, but today we're going to talk about APIs. So let me go just start sharing my screen. And I mentioned to some people <laughs> like before we started recording um, that I'm going to do some extra stuff today that I haven't done before with um, other cohorts. So just kind of bear with me if things don't quite work exactly as planned, but we'll get through it. All right, you guys all see my Jupyter notebook with the files in there? Cool, all right, awesome. So um, before we actually talk about APIs, there's gonna be kind of like a big topic. Um, we're gonna talk about JSON, which is the main part, I think it's actual section in topic nine. We're also gonna talk about XML, which is not actually in topic nine, but it's an actual, um, I think in the, in the appendix to topic nine. Um, so if you haven't, if you've gone through topic nine, you're like, wait, I haven't heard about XML. Um, we're going to talk about today. And part of the reason why is just because I think it's a useful thing to know it exists. Um, though, just know that JSON is going to be much more common, which is why we focus it a lot um, in the actual curriculum. Okay. So um, for the record, this these materials right can be found on this repo as always. Um, and then specifically, we're going to look at the data engineering folder. That's kind of how I put it in there. We're looking at um, JSON and XML, and then we'll talk about APIs. Okay. So let's talk about JSON next now. Oops, let's fold this down. Folding, sorry. Oh, this is just outside. Okay, so um, if you have, if you've heard of JSON before, here we go. If you heard of JSON before, um, that's kind of like the really nice like way to pass information back and forth. We'll talk about what it is. Um, there's also XML, which we'll talk about. And I don't know, my natural like look at like XML is like, ooh, it just looks uglier than JSON. And we'll see a little bit in Python, like that's double so. Um, JSON is really easy to um, use in Python itself. So let's get right into it. So we have JSON and we're going to import to the pan, um, library here just to kind of play around with it. And this right here is what JSON looks like. And note that JSON, right, not JSON, right, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. If anyone knows about the web stuff, you probably have heard of JavaScript, which is a web, um, it's a programming language that's used for scripting on the web almost exclusively right now, though there's a couple of contenders out there. Um, and then with that, you can see your object notation. Um, basically, is that JSON is literally like valid JavaScript. Um, so if you know JSON, you actually technically know some JavaScript. Um, and it actually notates for objects, um, which we haven't really talked about. But if you're familiar with object-oriented programming, that's where these really come through. Um, and you can see here, I think for the most part, these are relatively easy to read. And if you look closely, you probably can see like this doesn't look too far off from what Python might look like, right? If we had like, like you know, it might be some nested stuff. But what does this look like right here when I look at this like brace? Like, what's the thing that kind of screams in your head like what this looks like in Python? A dictionary. A dictionary, yeah. And that's kind of what it is. It looks like a dictionary. And you can see here, this would be like the dictionary. This would be a key, right? And this would be the value. In this case, the value is like would be another dictionary. In this case, it's just another JSON. Um, and you can see here, this is more traditional dictionary, a key, a value, a key, a value. Note that the true in this case for JSON is actually lowercase, not capital, subtle differences. Um, you can also see here is that there's a list, right? 
So you can see here, there's a little square bracket. And that's kind of what this is too. It's kind of a list um, in JavaScript. So I kind of wrote this little um, little table kind of break things down. So JSON, like we say about objects, right? Um, we have kind of a key and then a value. That's just like dictionaries in Python. Um, a, we call these arrays in JavaScript. Um, we have list in Python, very similar and actually similar notation too. Um, then we have strings. You can see we can still use uh, single quote or double quotes. We have numbers, right? Like uh, integers, floats, all that good stuff. Uh, the Boolean is probably the big, one of the biggest difference or subtle differences is they're still just true and false, but note that lowercase in JSON, JavaScript, and capital in Python. And then we also have the none type in Python. The equivalent for um, JavaScript is null. Okay. So that's kind of like the biggest like difference, but you can see it's pretty similar. And in fact, we'll see when we translate from JSON to Python, it's actually like a really like nice, easy um, thing to look at. Make, make sense so far? Okay. So just know that JSON is just another way to pass data across. Um, we'll use this to like just pass data. It's similar to that CSV, but it's a lot less structured, right? Like in a CSV, we have to have a column, right? A column, a column, and then data points. Here you can see it's a little more fluid, but you can kind of get an idea of what this is describing. This is describing a menu in this case, or it looks like a menu. And then there's things like ID. There's things like, is it a test? I don't know exactly what that means, but it could be as test. Uh, there's a value. It looks like there could be like a file name. Uh, pop up, right? So there's some value called pop up, and you can see here, and that's like, oh, it looks like a menu item, right? And then you can see like a list, maybe like of some other things you can have. So you can kind of see a little bit like where this data comes from and how this can pass along. Okay. So let's actually see what Python code this looks like. So there's actually some great uh, documentation in uh, Python's docs and stuff like this. Um, there's a built in library called JSON. Pretty easy, right? And what we can do, we can actually import JSON um, and actually open this file. In this case, I actually have this file this sample.json. And I think, yeah, man, you can see a little bit what this looks like. And I can actually import this into Python. So I can say open this file. And then D is just going to be what I keep, like my data. I just call it D equals json.load the file. So this code right here is going to load the library, open up the file, and then actually load the file contents, which remember is just essentially strings um, using the JSON library to create this thing D. And this D it turns out to be, if you look at this guy right here and you look at the original JSON, it's actually following really closely, but this is actually a valid um, Python object. So we can actually see, we do type, for example, of D. Oh, I have it below too, but you can see type is a dictionary. So you can see here, it's, like, it's just a dictionary um, and we can operate this as a normal Python stuff. It's very big in this case, you can see it's quite a lot of data, right? But you could operate this and kind of go through this um, JSON object now as if it's in Python. Um, note that there's some differences now. For example, you can see this Boolean uh, value is false, capital false, versus originally it was lowercase false. And that's because this was in JSON, and now this is valid Python. Make sense? Cool. All right. Um, stop me if you guys have any questions or if I'm going too fast, right? So let's actually check out like this. Um, since we know it's a, it's a dictionary, right? We can actually look at the keys. So let's do d.keys. I think I actually have to do, okay. You can see there's only two keys at the beginning, meta and data. And everything else is just nested in itself. So in this case, let's put df meta and df data. I'm actually going to create a data frame using the from dict method right here, okay, um, with meta and data. And you can see here, let's actually check out what that looks like. So let's just do df um, meta. Go ahead. Sorry, that's my little phone. Huh? My babies. Don't know why it's on. There we go. All right, you can see here a little bit of like um, the table, like the data being loaded in there. And we'll see like why this, like we might have to do some stuff with this. Um, but you can see is that the first part is like, oh, our key is attribution. Um, we can see average rating category. And we can see that comes directly from this meta part right here. So we can actually pull this data directly into a data frame. But note that this weird value right here for this columns is kind of funky. In fact, this is just a string right here. And so note that this is kind of, um, the, the thing about getting JSON into a data frame is that data frame expects kind of like tabular data um, where it's like comma separated values where JSON doesn't have to be, it can be a bunch of nested um, structure. So we just have to kind of be aware of that. Okay. Um, here's a, another value. Like let's say I have this in Python. So this is literal Python code and I have this called just D underscore Python. I can actually output this 
into a JSON format. So note, this is a common structure that we use in Python to like write out. And we can say with open, this is gonna be the name of the file that we're gonna to write to the W and then we're calling it as F. So this, this little guy right here is very common like with how we just write um, uh, like two files if we didn't have like a function to do it. And we can just do json.dump and then the Python code into this file. Okay, and what this is basically doing right here, this is opening up the file so we can write to it. This right here is literally dumping the stuff from Python code into a file itself. So if I run this now, it actually creates a file right here. In this case, what did I call it? Output.json. So you can see here, and there we go, get this um, JSON code or JSON um, output. Now note that like it's not nice and neat, like you can see compared to like um, what I might have like written out as, but it's still valid uh, JSON code. Okay. Make sense, everyone? Cool. All right. Any questions at all so far? Okay, so the biggest thing about Node for JSON is that one, it's just basically a data notation format. You're passing in data um, into, um, usually like you're passing it across computers and systems and stuff like this. Um, it's very common now, especially for web stuff. Uh, we'll see that in APIs and that we can actually load this directly into Python. And you saw that a little bit that um, JSON does really well matching like the different like things you can have in a JSON object. like. It's kind of redundant, but JSON, you can uh, basically map directly to Python and then we can operate on this Python object. So like I said, like I've got like the, um, the meta, meta here. Let's see if I can do a check out um, data. I think this one's a little neater. Oops, there we go. You can see this is a little bit closer to like what we want right here. And you can see here is that now we have this value. Now note that I didn't, because I did it from a dictionary in this case, the columns and stuff didn't make as much sense. It's a little bit harder for us to read, but you also note some of the values too aren't as nice as like, oh, here's a single value. You can see this almost like a dictionary of values. So something to keep in mind while you're iterating through um, your JSON, usually what happens is that you have to investigate it or know already what the format of, the, of JSON should be already versus like just like, oh, just load it into uh, Pandas. Okay, cool. All right. So I'm gonna talk about another one called XML. So this is called extensible, extensible markup language. Um, is anyone familiar with HTML, like, um, like web stuff? Yeah, XML is kind of like a generalized HTML. Um, HTML stands for hypertext markup language. XML is basically extensible, meaning that like you can use it for a lot of different things. It doesn't have to look like. So if you're familiar with HTML, which we'll see tomorrow, um, you would be, you'd probably read XML pretty decently. And you can see here is that it's another way to form data. And the big thing is that they use these things called tags. So you can see here like this tag, for example, note. And this basically says, all right, begin the note, you know, um, data, like that's gonna be part of the note data, if that makes sense. And this end note right here, you can see this like uh, forward slash at the beginning, that's kind of like ending the note. So it's kind of like you're um, packed between those two tags. Uh, note that I also like made it nice and like indented for us to read it better. XML doesn't really care about just like in JSON, um, doesn't really care about like the spacing. It could all be in one line. Um, so just kind of know that this is for me to make it nice and easy. And then you can see here in this note, it has things like to, from, heading, body. And inside these notes are kind of like, oh, this is the value of the two, you know, in this case, the two tag, um, the from tag and the heading tag and all that stuff. Make sense? Does that seem kind of reasonable? Cool. All right. So it's like, okay, how do we actually get this into Python, right? So someone gives us an XML thing, let's pass into Python. It's like, well, um, it's not as easy as it is in like um, JSON. JSON really does a really good, like it's really easy to pass into Python. XML has, or it has kind of like more of a tree hierarchical structure that we have to consider parse through like nested, what we call like nodes. So you can imagine like this as being like the first node and then there's like stuff in there. So what this looks like in code wise is I'm importing an actual library. Again, it's built into Python, but you can see here it's a little uglier, right? Import xml.etree.elementtree, and I just call it as et. So just, I don't have to type this whole long thing every single time. And I can do et.parse. So there's a parser for um, this data. And you can see this is just the file right here. And I think this is actually not going to open the way I expect it. Yeah, it's not going to open up the way I expect it because it's actually trying to train. Um, my browser is trying to interpret uh, the XML file directly into like HTML, which is why you're seeing um, this funkiness. But just know that this XML, it is formatted like an XML uh, structure. 
Um, so we actually go ahead and run this guy and we're actually going to parse it and we get something called like this tree and this tree basically allows us to like start from the very top like essentially the very first node and then kind of dig deeper into it okay and so we'll call that the root so now you can see a little bit i to actually go through this tree again it's a little more cumbersome you can see here for example i'm calling something first children i'm doing a list comprehension node for node and root um so what this looks like i'm going to break this down so i don't have to do this i can show you what first children look like So there's only one element in this case right here. And then you can see here, I can kind of keep digging deeper. In this case, I'm doing actually uh, two, like kind of four loops within itself. Um, in this guy, we're basically grandchild for node in root for grandchild in node. So basically what's happening is it's going deeper and deeper into this guy. And if I do this guy now, I think I can show you a little bit what that looks like. Oops, did I spell it wrong? I did spell it wrong. Okay, and you can see here, now it's like, you can see that this guy right here in Python, as you guys probably have noticed, this just means like a certain kind of object that we'll have to like um, investigate and stuff like that and look into. But you can see a little bit like now it's kind of getting all these like both called the grandchildren. So you can kind of imagine like one layer um, below this, okay? So like kind of like this only had like the, you can imagine this is like kind of like the parent up here. And then each of these are kind of like the children of that parent because they're nested within. And if I had another thing nested in there, it would be, the children of the children, or like grandchildren. Okay, makes sense. Cool. All right. I'm just going through it quickly. So, a little bit of how this can look. We can actually print out aspects of it. So, remember the first children was this guy right here. I can actually take the first element in there, right? And then actually print out the tag and the attribute. So, this actually shows me a little bit of like what those things are. In this case, this tag is a row. So, that means actually the value was like, uh, row right here and the attribute can actually be something that's within our um what's it called inner tag itself so we'll see that a lot in html and then we can do the same thing with like grandchildren so for example just to show you how many grandchildren there are i think there's something like 100 or maybe 200 yeah 285 grandchildren so that means how many are actually kind of further further deep down and you can see that this first, let's just pull out the first grandchild and look at the tag and the attribute and you can see here there's the row right here okay and that attribute, because you can have multiple attributes, this just comes out as a dictionary. So you can see here, ID one, UUID, and so on. So if I wanted to show you what, what does that actual like XML file look like? Let's do, uh, what was it called again? Sample XML. So I'm just gonna print out the first few parts. Sample.xml. And you can see here, that's what this originally looked like. And you can see it's just all one line. It's not nice and pretty like before. We see the first part's response, and then the child is row. And then inside that row, it's another like element in this case. And this is all the headings. This is actually the first grandchild right here. It is going from about right through here. And you can see here, these are the attributes that I was kind of referencing. So UUID, the value, position. And this gives kind of like extra data about the specific tag. Okay, so that's what this is coming out. Okay, does that make sense to people roughly? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay. <laughs> so one way you can kind of look at this too is that like this was like, what does this mean? Like when I see this first child, what that means is that there was something that looked like row and there's no attributes, so I don't have to worry about it. Oops. I'm kind of just like writing it right here. And then there's like stuff. Okay, and that's what where the grandchildren are gonna be. Like that's what like what's inside of the child. But like you see, that's what this is telling me. This right here, this is actually showing me something that looks kind of like the tag. So I was like, okay, it's another tag that looks like row. And then it's actually, so I'm gonna say like end of the row. So that's the end of the tag. There's some stuff in here. This is like the great grandchildren stuff. Inside this is something like ID equals uh, one, you know, and then there's like UID equals, you know, that other stuff. Okay. So the idea there is that there's information being passed along here and that we could like read this um, and kind of figure things out. So um, again, this is more older school. It's not as commonly used now, um, but it's used for a lot of different systems and stuff, but this is how you can kind of parse out this information. So to kind of look at like what this looks like, if I were to kind of go through like the first 10 grandchildren, I think, 
or I'm actually digging through the whole tree. You can see the first uh, one was response and then row. And then inside that was row again, um, like a different with different attributes. And then there's something like candid, can name, office, borough, uh, can class. And then look like there's another, in this case, there's another um, like next row. And you can see this a little bit. It's a little hard for us to read here, but you can see here that's the first, like the parent. This is the first child. And we just keep going, like, if I wanted to see like, okay, where does this like first row end, this first child, I keep going until I hit that element right here, which is kind of like the backslash row. So this is all like one, you know, um, child in there. And so inside that is the grandchild, which ends, let's see here. Oh, I spoke too soon, actually. This, this row right here hasn't ended yet. You can see, because there's another row. This would end whenever we see the second well, like the next um, backslash row. That makes sense to he It's hard to see in this format, but like you can imagine if they're indented a little bit or spaced out. But the first thing in there is this guy. This is the first grandchild and it ends right here. And you can see inside this grandchild, you can see right here, there's candid and there's a value in candid or candid, I should say, canned ID. It's really what it's probably trying to say. And you see canned name, right? And you can see office borough and the value and so on. And then we get to the next row. And so we go to the row. These are all a bunch of like extra attributes to tell us about this row, like what this means. And then the actual data in here, in this case, it's election, candid, um, candid name. So we have Sandy, um, their office, which is office CD, office district. And it keeps going until it hits the end of this row, okay? So you can see a little bit like, there's still data being passed through there. Um, I think in the most part, like it's fine when you read it, like what's it called? Like if it's nice indented, but this is a little bit harder, I think for us to see like the nestedness, okay? So that, hopefully that kind of makes a little more sense. Um, now it's great it, actual like data frame from this data. You can see it's gonna be a lot harder, but you can see if I run this guy right here, I'm not gonna go through the whole code, but basically iterating through each row and just pulling up data from here and putting it into a data frame. In this case, I'm just uh, pending a data frame each time. This is super inefficient, by the way, but like it gets the job done. And you can see here, this, this makes a little more sense of maybe like what's going on here. So I'm actually pulling things like the ID and then the, um, the UEID, the position and then the address and so on. And I can do this for each element. So there's only, if I look at, um, let's see here, if I do, oops, let's do DF. To call the yeah, df.info. You can see here there should be 285 entries, and that's because there's 285 different rows. Okay. Does that make sense, people? Okay. I have Questions, a question. Becky. Mm -hmm. I think you already mentioned this, but um, just like the overall purpose of this language mm -hmm. um, is HTML, it's kind of like presenting the format of the data, and the XML is like storing stuff behind the web page. Yeah, like XML can be like, for example, I used to work with um, a company, their, their system passed XML back and forth to a server. And that basically represented a transaction of saying like, okay, there's like something called a transaction. And say, like, okay, tell me if, like, and then the nodes in there told trans, um, details about the transaction, like who made the transaction? Um, how much was the transaction made? Was it a deposit? Was it a withdrawal? And that's the kind of thing that this XML format would kind of come across. Um, you can totally do like XML. You could do JSON instead. It would be like the same data. It's just structured differently, right? So yeah, cool. All right. So uh, one question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. So there is no code like a read underscore XML, like pd dot read. That's the way that we used to read CSP. I thought that there was a code something like that. There, there might be some libraries out there that like do something similar, but this is the closest. Um, oh, you're talking about like for PD, right? There could be something actually pandas. Let's yeah, I don't PD, use this often. PD dot read XML or something. I, yeah, maybe I am. No, this is a li I, this is a library. Yeah, there, there. I don't think. See, you can already see like the fact that I googled it the first time and it didn't come up. Yeah. makes me say like, it's probably not like just a read XML. And that's kind of makes sense. I think JSON actually is in there. JSON does that because I know for, 
or, or read JSON mm -hmm. exists. Yeah. I thought and, it's... Yeah, I'm trying to see if there's an XML. I, the closest one, maybe HTML. I'd have to see, but I think the parser wouldn't work as well here because okay. it might be meant for it might be meant for HTML. I don't know if this would actually work for XML, um, but you can kind of see already like immediately when I like search for pan, like pandas XML, like it's not pointing to documentation. The first thing that's like something that's not like a question is like this package, which in my head is like, oh, that's not promising. <laughs> like, um, and the real reason why is because to be honest, um, XML is just more of a more of an outdated format of a, it's not outdated. It's just not as frequently used nowadays um, across most industries. But you might come across it, like I said, like it just depends on, you know, who you're working with. But yeah, yeah, unfortunately this is like the closest I could find that wasn't like installing a bunch of different random libraries. I'm pretty sure there's better ways to like get this data with a better library. Um, but like if you use the stuff that's already pre-installed, you know, and then Pandas, like this is the best I found. Yeah, but I wouldn't worry too much about this. Like if you had kind of came across XML data, my guess is like your goal would be like, let me just find a package or something that's gonna read it into something I'm a little more familiar. Maybe there's something like an XML to put JSON parser and then like work with JSON or something like that. Cause there's not a huge difference between the two. I think in the sense of like what data you can um, pass back and forth. Cool, any other questions um, or comments? I don't see anyone asking anything in the chat. Okay, I was pulling up the chat. I realized I never had it up. So, okay, no one's asking, good. All right, so just comparing the two formats, um, <laughs> this is like a classic XML version. And then this is like JSON, um, obviously it's a bit of a meme, but like this does feel a lot like people are like, oh, like there's so much data in here, which is like useful, but like XML can feel very like, I remember looking at XML many days and just being like, my eyes just kind of just going, ah, just so much. It's a little, it's a little too verbose, which is the real reason why it's been used less. Where JSON is a little bit more like concise. Obviously, this is giving a lot more information than this right here. We'll tend to go towards JSON. Um, this is pretty typical, <laughs> like um, giving XML as a response, which totally can happen. Um, but usually, it's like, ah, oh, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> um, usually, JSON is kind of like, like it's just nice, as you can see in Python. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to show you a little quickly, like uh, you can actually write out your JSON format in here with, um, I don't know, so, oh, I must've messed up right here. This should have been, oops, no, okay. I think I was, oh, I, I know what I'm doing. This is a mistake for some reason. Past Victor made a mistake, never present Victor. Um, you can see here, this is the same data in JSON format in XML format. And you can see like, there's just a different way of viewing things. And I, I think this is a little too, like, you can imagine if we had like a thousand items under menu item, like you'd have to put menu item every single time for each of those items, which can be kind of a little too much where this is a little more easy for us to kind of parse through and stuff like that. So JSON tends to be the more preferred method, um, but you'll see XML every once in a while. All right, any questions or comments? Uh, yeah, just one quick question. Is there like a way to just open up an XML file where it's, it might just be like tabbed properly? Yeah, no. <laughs> um, I mean, I would say like, you can probably find like an IDE. So like, this is like an editor, um, like VS code. I'm sure there's extensions. I, I know there's even extensions. Like I don't use them because I'm not a web developer, but I know people who are web developers. They'll have extensions for JSON, and I'm sure you can find something similar for XML that will like look, you know, properly formatted and indented. Um, there's no reason why you can't. It's just that um, it's not like, yeah, it's like it's it, technically equivalent. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think if you open in a Linux terminal, it might display it properly, but mm, it depends. No, no I mean because the the terminal is just basically just repeating, saying, "Hey, just show me what you like." just give me the string of data. And unless you're opening it with something that's expecting XML or an extension to like your editor or your terminal or a tool or something like that, it's just not gonna know um, like how it should be formatted. Um, this is why, for example, like for the record, like I don't know if you guys have ever done things like this, like you can rename stuff, like just rename the extension. And now the computer's like, oh, let me just go ahead and read it. And it just tries to read it. Now you can actually, read this, like, you know, the code versus you could saw um, the XML before that I showed was like, didn't show this at all. Um, but 
to actually space it out, you either physically have to do it, like which would be awful, um, or more likely you'd use an extension or something that would do a better viewing. Um, things like Prettify and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of short. Um, the main thing is like when you have to deal with it every single day, you find ways to make it work. Um, when you deal with it once, you just like just like bite the bullet and say, "All right, I'm gonna do this one time and just like deal with this." Um, that's usually that's been kind of like how I done stuff because otherwise you can go down the rabbit hole of doing too many extensions and random stuff. Yeah, sound pretty good. Any other comments, questions on XML, JSON? Um, now that we'll talk mostly about JSON, Carly, go ahead. Um, from like a system design perspective, is there like any reason why someone might choose XML over JSON? Hmm, that's a good question. I so the reason I, I'm kind of going the opposite is like, okay, why would someone pick JSON over XML? And other than being like just more common, um, JSON has less redundancy built into it. Um, <laughs> I like safe, so I gluttony for punishment. Um, but uh, I think that XML like you could maybe reason there's redundancy in like how things are presented. For example, you can see menu items repeated multiple times. So you could look at a specific line and like don't have to go all the way to the beginning of like where like it first starts with the nesting. Um, that could be maybe a reason. To be honest, like they're pretty equivalent to each other. So I think you can see a little bit, it's like passing large amounts of data, like this is going to be a lot more easy to like condense because you don't have this redundancy and like extra tags and stuff. But to be honest, you'll mostly see it just because like that's what the business has been using like forever. And that's kind of what they have. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe someone else out there <laughs> might know some more than me, but that's, that's been my experience. Yeah. Yeah. I ran into a situation at a company last year I was working with mm -hmm. that had a ton of XML um, it wasn't a data science project, but they kept trying to move to, to JSON and all their new development, but they didn't have a lot of skills in house to do it. They had 20 years of XML code base on their B2B platform, and they just kept kind of doing it, you know, over and over because everything was already there and they knew how to do it. So yeah. they, they were having a hard time crawling out of it. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty common, I would say, across industries where if you're just stuck with doing something one way, it's kind of like it's more effort in some ways just to get out of it, even if it's like technically better once they do the switch, the actual like hill to climb over to make that transition can be tough. Like if you if you like for the record, if you have as a data scientist, like structure things as more agnostic and just like, oh, well, I'm going to pass it through a parsing element and then pull in the data into a certain form, then it doesn't really matter too much at the beginning as long as you can parse it. But if you start taking shortcuts, which usually happens over long periods of time, um, and you're expecting XML, for example, like you're not going to be able to handle, you know, that code and stuff like that. And that's where you hear companies talk about transition periods and stuff like that. If anyone hasn't worked for those kind of companies where they talk about transitioning a new tool, um, that's usually not a fun place to be at. Um, the record. But anyway, but yeah, um, yeah. In general, you'll see XML because they've been using it. <laughs> yeah, that, I think that was Chuck. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. So I'm going to move on then to APIs, which is what we're really talking about JSON here for. Um, and we'll see kind of like an HTML, like XML-S kind of stuff, but really JSON's the main hero here. So um, this one we're talking about in the data engineering APIs, and we're going to show you, I'm going to show you a couple examples actually, um, but we're going to talk about what an API is. So um, first of all, I know some already people have like computer science background. Um, who's like, give me a thumbs up. Like, or you know, chime in like who's seen APIs or kind of like knows a little bit about APIs already. All right, I see some. I see some thumbs up. Sorry to shake your head too. Um, would anyone like to like try to summarize what they would call an API? Like a quick 10, 20 seconds. Like when you see when I say API, what comes to your mind for people who are familiar with it? Well, I mean, I can I can say on um, some projects I've worked on, companies would publish external APIs for their customers or partners to be able to uh, receive and pass data back and forth. Um, and so they were published endpoints uh, like beyond their secure networks um, to be able to like transmit transactions back and forth. Yeah, programmatically. In in my. 
in my, in my sorry uh in my experience kind of like super high level for what i've known uh apis to be is uh, more just like what our code does and how to use it pretty much like what the methods and objects are trying to accomplish that we made <laughs> yeah great i think that's great and i think the main thing you can think of like apis for people who aren't familiar with them it's more it's in a lot of ways like someone else has built something and you're basically interacting with that and that's where really like that's where you can see like apis application programming interfaces it's like how do you interface with the thing that someone's already put together um and that way you don't have to know every detail of it you just really need the result of it and we'll see that in apis and what that looks like uh, which is really convenient um so i uh, just know that um there's typical ways to get data right json or xml usually we'll see a lot of json um, just because that's most common and it's most common in apis um really you can think of like apis as like um as a communication way like how we communicate data back and forth so this is where you can talk about things like you know application to another application so usually the way this works is like you send a request with some info or some data saying okay like you know for example your api might be like hey um like i am requesting you know the distance to from here to you know like san francisco right like you know it passes some information and then um it goes to another place let's just say like a server uh, in this case and you get a response of like new data um possibly even like it does a service so usually we're talking about apis and data science in the sense that like oh we will get data back but it could also do things so maybe you actually send like an api request um this is what we call like a request right and the the system actually does a thing does some kind of service so for example um, we'll see later is that we'll control some uh, smart lights that I have with through an API and actually use that to say, okay, like, you know, send this request out and it'll give you a response back, but it'll also do something too. So some examples of this are like financial transactions or just transactions in general. Um, that doesn't have to be finance, right? Um, posting to Twitter. Uh, Twitter has a great API. Um, a lot of uh, students end up using the Twitter API for their own projects and stuff like this where they can pull data from it, but also a Twitter API allows you to do a service, right? It allows you to do things on the Twitter website itself. So you can create things like bots and stuff like that, kind of like updates and stuff. Um, though for the record, uh, Twitter API has kind of been locked down a little bit more in the recent years because of uh, all the crazy stuff as I'm sure you guys are familiar. Also things like IoT, um, IoT is becoming a little more common. I'll uh, talk about like what this looks like. So like individual device, um, IoT even people don't know what it is, is um, internet of things. So can they like smart lights, you know, things like uh, Google Homes and Amazon Echoes and stuff like that can do stuff. Um, but you should know that they're always like a software to software interaction. Um, when we talk about like an API, you're basically having some software talk to other software and those softwares can do things to like the hardware and stuff. Um, that's usually what we're talking about in API. I shouldn't say always, I should say that's what we really think about with APIs. Um, some parts of an API. So we have things like access permissions. Are you allowed to ask actually ask and request something. So that's kind of like the first check it usually does. Um, we also have like API call and request. So usually we have code that will basically make an API call or request. Uh, you'll hear those interchangeably used to implement some complicated task or feature. So imagine like if I'm doing the API call in the scenario, it's like, oh, distance from here to San Francisco. Well, that's a lot of actual information. Like, like what roads do you take? You know, like how, how fast are you traveling? Or like, you know, what distance should I use in this? That's all taken care of by the API, um, the, the server, we call it, like the, basically the, the thing that's going to process that information versus me saying what exactly I want to do. Um, so we're kind of relying on the server to do that work for us. Um, and then um, I think uh, Eric had mentioned like things like methods, like what things can we ask? You can actually say like, oh, these are the things you can ask. For example, if I have an API, I might not be able to have it do certain things, right? Like you can say, oh, I want this thing. Well, the API doesn't support that. And usually a good API will give you the response of why this was why it failed um, and then parameters you can think of parameters to kind of like information that you're sending out in your request okay and then your response i uh, usually are always given some kind of response where that's the, the result of the request to make more data uh could be the result of saying oh this service was enacted or it could be an error result um so that response basically telling you like all right cool like was it successful was it not successful or oh here's some data okay cool sound pretty Good. All right. Um, yeah, just know that most modern APIs use JSON, but you just gotta be aware that, you know, there can be some extra formats getting sent through. Um, like I said, like I worked with a system that used XML explicitly in the API. Um, it was internal um, 
and just kind of something you just have to be aware of. Okay. Cool. All right. So API types, you'll see some main stuff. The main one we're going to think about are these two, but know that these also exist when you hear people talk about APIs. So the main one is like the web uh, interface. We can work on both the client end. So we have things like the, the Twitter REST API. So you can see here a little bit, there's documentation about how to like use Twitter, the API itself. Um, there's also things like Amazon's S3 API. So that actually allows you, um, is anyone familiar with Amazon S3 or heard that before? Um, you hear that more as a data scientist. It's basically a storage bucket, right? You're just basically storing a whole bunch of data. So there's actually an API you can communicate with the, the S3 buckets and stuff like this. Um, databases, right? So you can do like pass back data in a specific format. Um, it's generalizable. So that way you can kind of like ask, hey, give me this data here. It's kind of like, it's, you can almost think of like SQL, but then you don't have to actually run the SQL code. You're relying on whoever's creating, you know, this API to take care of whatever little complicated action. You can say like, oh, give me back this information and it can kind of give you back data. Okay. Um, the stuff are least common, like at least for us as data scientists, but they do exist. Like APIs can refer to operating systems. So for example, when I like click my mouse on here, there might be an API that says like, okay, this is what's happening. And like basically communicates from the hardware to the software to, to basically this thing comes back and feedback and things like that. Um, and then of course we have the actual hardware APIs. So like, you no know, people talk about like, you know, how the hardware talks to each other and stuff like that. That's also can be through APIs and stuff. In general though, like I won't worry too much about this. It's really mostly about like the web stuff. Um, and then maybe a little bit like a database specifically, you know, having an API, kind of like how you would have a SQL command. Okay. Cool. So um, some things to know about APIs, client server model. So this is very like, this is like how we usually phrase things. So I kind of been saying like, oh, I ask a question, you know, to get a response. So in this scenario, I am a client that was like, oh, I like my code or whatever I'm doing is the client that's asking questions and then talking to the server that's going to process my response or process my um, request. We call this like a query, process that and then return with me with the response. Okay. Whether that's a failure, a success, or extra data. So um, usually you can kind of think like the server is like, separate from the climate client. Technically, that's not always true for all APIs, but usually we can kind of think of like an API call is that we're usually doing it somewhere else, usually online, because we're talking about web requests and stuff like this. And a client is requesting a service. Um, so you can think of this either being like, depending on the situation, it could be like a hardware itself that's doing the the request. Like I just, I shouldn't say the hardware, but the hardware doing using software to make a request or you directly writing code, for example. Um, if anyone's played with like smart stuff, like smart switches and stuff like this, when you press something, right, it's making an API call usually to the server to say, hey, someone's, you know, press this button, you know, turn off their lights or whatever um, is the response or like the service itself on the server. And then response usually goes back to the light. So that's in the, hey, they turn off the light. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so we basically have our client our server, and you can imagine like the server actually communicating with internally. So you as the client don't really get to see this process over here, but we are basically asking the query and you get the response. So the server does all the work for us again. Okay. Um, I'm just kind of showing you some examples, right? Web example, uh, when you actually use your browser and like go somewhere, like essentially it's your browser is the client and is requesting to the servers of information. So it's actually when you go to a website, you are actually making in a sense an API call and say, hey, like, here's the website I'm going to, you know, um, give me data on this website, basically give me the web website page and then it sends you the website page from the server. Okay. Um, so for example, like I said, HTTP. So if you guys always know, like, you know, what is that, uh, you know, <laughs> you don't even see it in Google here. There it goes. All right. HTTPS, HTTP, basically that right there is the hypertext, um, hypertext something transfer protocol. So that's kind of like the way that works. Um, it's basically an API. Um, yeah, so the, some steps you should just kind of know that it generally does. You generally don't have to know like how these structures work because usually we're not making these APIs necessarily. You can be in some cases, but the first thing usually happens is like, hey, can we authenticate um, the user? Can we authenticate the client? And then um, when we have, what's it called? Like when, once we authenticate, it's like, okay, let's look at the request. So if it can't authenticate the request, it's not even gonna look at that. But if it can't authenticate, it's like, okay, it looks good. Let's go ahead and do a request um, or look at the request and then actually performs actions, processes and needs, and then sends response to the client. Okay, so that's kind of like the general flow of like how um, on the server side, like what that looks like. Okay. Um, and database is very similar. So, okay. 
kind of get to this so we can get enough time to actually play around with APIs. Uh, but are there are any questions so far? We're just going through it. I think for the most part, it's, if you just, if you memorize like this picture in your head, I think this is going to be like all you really, like really need to worry about with APIs. Okay. Hey, uh, Victor, um, real quick, one <laughs> question. Um, it, as it relates to data science, um, like a predictive model of some sort, mm -hmm. um, is it typical for APIs to be used in like a production uh, predictive model, you know, customers mm -hmm. on the phone and there's like an, you know, they, something happens and there's like an API call to determine like how to handle that customer or something like that. Yeah. Or yeah, that's, that's absolutely um, really common. Like you're saying more like since like, oh, you built as a data scientist, a model. And then um, like a customer or even maybe another business uh, makes a request on the, a with the API for that model. And then right. the responses with like a prediction or something like, like that. the response of the model is coming back through the API so that the model itself mm -hmm. is exposed on the API. Yeah. Yeah. So that's very common. Okay. And you can see, uh, hopefully you can kind of see where that kind of fits in here, right? Where the yep. server would essentially would be using the model to make the prediction, the query or, you know, the call, the request coming from, you know, whoever's making that request. Um, they might pass in like, oh, here's the data. Like, you know, for example, let's just say we have a model that does like a picture, right? And um, you can, through the API, you can upload a picture and then the model is gonna look at that picture and tell you, you know, what's in like, um, is there a dog in it or a cat in it? And so does the model right here, does the processing, you know, completely separate from the client itself. And says, okay, it's a dog. And it sends that response like, oh, it's a dog. And the client might see, for example, um, then like, okay, the response is, oh, it, this, what, this picture you sent me, it's a dog, so. Yeah, that's very common. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. And note that there's um, systems to kind of create this too. And we can talk more about this as we get further into it. Um, but I think, again, like as long as you picture this, like I think you can kind of see like where all those parts uh, match up to. All right. Um, but at least for requesting data for ourselves, usually we can use like libraries like URLib or URLib2, um, but they can be kind of comp complicated. Um, so one uh, important one that's kind of nice to use is request. Uh, it's request library, excuse me. And it allows you to kind of pass data in really quickly. So this is built into Python. And you can see here, all I'm going to do here is request.get. So I'm getting a response from this, um, essentially the server, which is Google. And you can see the response is this guy. And I actually run this guy now and say, what is this response? Was, okay, well, it's uh, actual request.models.response is actually just a response. I can see, for example, the status code. If I know what status codes are, I can see, you know, was it a failure? Was there some, you know, was it not authenticated or whatnot? In this case, you can actually see response code 200, which basically is like, oh, that means you're okay. Like everything's okay. Like it was a good response. Um, we can also look at like the actual response, like the values in there. Like, like what did it like? Okay, it gave us like, okay, it looks good, but like, did it give us any extra data? In this case, we can actually do the response.txt. And you can see here, it's actually a full HTML file. And in fact, if I were to pull this up, this is literally just the web page for google.com. That's what's going on here. So um, it just to kind of display a little bit like what's going on here, I can show you the headers. And you can see here, it tells me some extra information that you might not normally see, like when you actually pull up the website, uh, but you can see here from like the date when it was happened, uh, expires, could cache control. So it might give you extra information beyond the actual like, um, like full text of like what the response is. So it's kind of nice to, uh, be able to pull that information up on some APIs. And again, this is usually in documentation too, right? Like if you were using an API to actually get information from it, you probably would look at the documentation to see what kind of headers, what kind of response text would you expect? And you can test it against yourself. Um, and as you see, for example, I can pull up information. So for example, headers, date, you can see, I think that's specific value. So it's kind of nice to be able to just pull this information up. Okay. Sound pretty good? Cool. Okay. Um, here. So in this case, there's actually this really great little uh, website, httpbin.org. Um, you can kind of practice playing around with like um, using the API. And so for example, I can actually say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and get like do a re uh, request to this website. Note that the slash get so I can get this stuff. And I'm actually params, I'm passing in a, um, a dictionary of uh, parameters. So you can see your username is Luigi, password, password is I love peach or I less than three peach. Okay. And you can see a little bit as we can see the results, r.json, right? And then we can actually pull up specific parts. So I actually did this first because I didn't just want my IP address floating around on the recording. So <laughs> that's why I replaced it with none. But you can see here is that 
if I pull this up right here, this website, um, in fact, I'll go ahead and put this in the chat right now. You can see what the website looks like. Um, but you can see here, I can actually get this response, but now the response has arguments. It actually shows me what I passed, you know, what I passed forward. Oh, in this case, I passed pa the password, username, and then actually passing the information like headers, and then actual like, you know, for example, the URL here and the origin, and I can actually print out um, whatever I want in this case. Okay, makes sense. Cool. And note that this is gonna be different for depending on what you make the request to. They're gonna give you different information. Um, one thing I know is like a, a get versus a post. So just note that post allows you to do, um, it's more of a protocol. We're not gonna go into full detail on this, but just know because there's this separate protocol um, that allows you to do certain things. For example, um, it allows you to like, in this case, you can actually run um, with multiple example files and stuff like this. So I can actually run this. In this case, I don't know if this will actually work because I don't think I actually have any files in here. Yeah, so I'm not done. But you can kind of get the idea that I could actually use the same request thing to like, do certain actions and stuff like this. And this request.post just depends on what URL I go to. So that's why I'm doing this guy. Okay. Cool. Sound pretty good? Okay. All right. This might feel very abstract, but I promise you that it's going to get a little bit, I think it's going to explain a little bit more when you do with some examples. Um, one last thing I did want to note, just because the curriculum talks about it, is OAuth. Just know basically, I'm not going to go through this whole thing because it is in the curriculum. Um, basically, the OAuth is allowing us to authenticate saying we are the person we are saying we are. Um, and basically, it allows like this kind of like this process of saying, okay, like this is the person authenticating that this person is tr um, who they say they are and allows you then so you don't have to. Um, we'll see a little bit like we have an API key that we can like hold on to. This is again, um, a process that you'll see commonly. So just know that like this is, service exists. Um, it's essentially like an alternative to a username and password, or like you can imagine an like API key in secret. We'll talk, we'll show you a little bit of API keys. Um, allows you like access without a user password. So authentication is separate from authorization. So remember, authentic, um, in this case, just know that authentication is talking about saying you are who you say you are. Authorization says, are you allowed to see this stuff? Um, so that's kind of the difference between authentication versus authorization. So then it's like OAuth, right? OAuth is open authority. Uh, authorization, authorization, right? Is that you're basically saying, are you allowed to look at this stuff? Um, and they do that through the authentication process as well. So, okay. So just kind of know this process exists. Um, if you're curious, definitely look at the curriculum resources, but I'm not going to go into it because um, it's kind of a separate thing. So I'm not going to stress too much about it. Okay. Any questions or comments? Pretty good. Cool. All right, I tried, I, I think I might, I got through that pretty quickly, um, but like, and it's probably a lot of like technical stuff and then it's like, oh man, like authentication, you know, client servers. I honestly think like once you start using an API, it's a lot easier just like, oh, I can see how this is being used. So we're going to do that today. So let me go ahead and pull up this notebook. I'm going to close these guys so I don't get confused. And um, is anyone familiar with LifeX by chance? Probably not. It's a little smaller company. It's actually in Australia. Uh, they do smart lights and stuff like this. And so I have some uh, smart home stuff. Um, and one of the things is like, I have a light. So um, I actually use these uh, LifeX um, bulbs and I'll actually pass you guys this website if you guys want to look at it while I'm talking. But um, they have a great developer thing and I really like their stuff because they've been very open. Um, I'm not like like an ad for like LifeX or whatever, but I really do support a lot of their stuff. Um, if you are interested in ever getting these bulbs, like let me know because I do have some like, like coupon codes and stuff like that because I just really like it. And my goal, honestly, is to event, they're a little more expensive. Like I mean, there's like other smart light stuff, they're a little more expensive, but I have a lot of control and we'll talk about like why that is, or like like what we can do with that. But anyway, it's great for us to practice a little bit, um, JSON progress. I'm actually gonna let you guys control my own home lights in a second. Um, so stick with me, right? All right, so uh, first thing we're gonna do is import JSON, import requests so that I can process it. And then this guy right here, you'll see like from secrets import LifeX from secrets real import LifeX as LifeX real. And like, whoa, what's going on? This is actually so, let me close this guy. <laughs> um, let me pull up, where's, there it is. Okay, this is actually a file. So secrets.py. And you can see here, we're not gonna go into full details, but this is basically, if you are using what we call an API key, which we'll talk about in a second, um, this is what you should do. You should have it in a separate file, essentially. You should never, in your notebook, show your API key. Um, the reason why is that if you put your API key in your notebook, um, 
someone else, especially if you upload to GitHub, someone else can now, now see your uh, API key, which basically authenticates you as you. Essentially, it's your password um, in a lot of ways. And so that's authenticating as you as you. And if you have something that's really important, for example, like your Amazon credentials, um, AWS credentials, someone could use your API key to um, do whatever they want or act as you, which can include like buying servers and like mining Bitcoin or whatever they do. Um, I do know, and it's actually like well known out there is that people, um, there are people with bots that literally search through public GitHub um, repos and look for things that look like API keys and try to pull that up so they can use it themselves. Um, it's not hard to build, um, so you really should be careful. And one thing with GitHub you should always know is that if you do accidentally release your API key out there on GitHub, um, and you're like, oh shoot, I made a mistake, and then you make a new change and you do git add, git commit, git push, are you safe now? No, because your history is public. So it's even if you erase it, like the most recent thing, your history still exists. So for the record, if you ever do an API, right, and you do put an API key out there, um, the first step to like, if you ever have this, like literally just set your um, account to private or like set that um, repo to private. So that way other people can access it and then figure out how to get rid of this history in there. Um, but it does happen to people. Um, I've known people who have done this and they've racked up a sizable amount of money from an um, AWS key. And thankfully AWS is pretty like relaxed and be like, that's okay, we make enough money. We'll forgive you for this time. Um, but not but something fun to look at um, where you have like a few thousand dollars in bills that you did not do yourself. So anyway, that's where this secret stop, secrets import. I'm importing this secrets.py and then I can use these values in here. So if I do this now, I can go ahead and run this guy. And if the secret's real, it's like my real key. I'm just like putting it out there. So it, even if you do get it, I'm gonna revoke the access later on. So don't worry about it too much. But I'll show you a little bit like how you might do this stuff. So um, let's say I have the token. It's gonna be LifeX default token. Um, I'm passing a header. So this is actually from the documentation. If I were to pull up this documentation, it tells you a little bit like what things they expect. And you can see this URL. So I can see request.get. I'm gonna say, okay, lights all. But in this case, this token is not valid. In fact, if I uh, show you what that token looks like, you can see it's just random letters and junk. Like that's what it'll look like. Um, but this is not a real token. So if I actually run this now, you'll see <laughs> invalid credentials. So, okay, this is my response, right? Like I gave it invalid credentials in that response. I made a request saying, hey, here are my credentials with the header. Um, here's the URL, you know, give me Victor's lights. This is, ah, no, 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 you don't have that permission. Um, so that's why this is invalid. So what does this look like if it is valid? So in this case, I got my real LifeX real using the default token. And I run this guy now and you actually see, you can display and you can see all my special lights. So you can actually see a little bit of like all the stuff that's on here. Um, things like the name of the lights, whether they're on, how bright they're on, all this stuff. And you can see here, it's JSON, right? So you can actually look at that. It's not ugly XML stuff that you don't have to deal with. Okay. But like, obviously like JSON's nice, but like, oh, this is kind of, this is kind of messy, right? I want to go through it a little easier. Well, we can explore it a little bit better. So one is we can just load into a data frame. So I'm actually going to go ahead and load my lights here from this dictionary of stuff. And you can see here, now I can see a little bit better. So you can see, okay, here I have an ID, UID, label, connected, power, color, false, or color, brightness, effect. And you can see a little bit, it's a little bit, you know, this, for example, color has some extra information in here, but you can see here, it's like, oh, I can see like, for example, the label, what these lights are, and then some extra information about like, you know, how are they on, for example, or, or sorry, are they connected? Um, are they on or off? And you can see here, all the lights are on except for, or all the lights are off except for this one right here. That's the main living room. And you can see some extra information too, so like what's last seen and all that stuff. So that's kind of like how we can process through that. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, so let's say we just want to see what the lights are. We can do for light and lights, right? So that's just the DF. And you can see here, I get all the name of the lights. All right, pretty nice. If I wanted to pick a light by ID, you can see here, I can pick that specific, you know, for example, in this case, play area light, uh, this ID. All right, make sense so far? Cool, all right. So let's go through this one. So this light right here is better than light one. And this is actually next to me. You can't see it on because it's not on right now, um, but it's like literally sitting right here. So we can actually start interacting with this light. So I'm gonna use this bedroom light one and I'm gonna go just power it on. So in this case, I'm gonna pass it in some parameters. In this case, I'm gonna say, this is from the documentation. Say, oh, states. 
And then from this state, there's a select uh, selector, and it specifically get this uh, label ID. So that's the bedroom light ID, power it on. And then if I run this, this should, in theory, turn on. There we go. So you can see a little bit, I was able to control like my light through like this uh, code. And if you actually look at the response too, you can see the response actually gives me some results. Kind of ugly, right? So we can actually say, hey, response.json, which is a really cool trick. It makes it nice and neat. And you can see here, it says, okay, status is okay. Label bedroom light one, results, and then operation. So you can see a little bit like, it's giving you some information, basic confirmation, like, oh yes, it worked. Okay, cool. Um, right now I have like this on blue, so I ran this earlier. So let's say, for example, I think you can do green. And I can actually say, okay, give me some extra, uh, more complicated stuff here. In this case, if I run this now, this should turn green there. I don't know if that color would change in a way that you guys can tell, but you can see a little bit of what that looks like. So you can see a little bit, like I can programmatically actually change some values on here. So let's get like turn it red. And you can, of course, see the response in this case. And just basically, in this case, it's just telling me like what you did. I'm just like, oh, status is okay. If I did something, let's say, I don't know, flirple. If I try running this now, first of all, it has not changed for flirple, right? But you can see a little bit, it's like, hey, message does not have a valid value. So it's letting me know, it's like, hey, you tried doing something and it didn't quite work out. Um, so it's trying to give me a response of like where this error came in. Yeah, sound pretty good. And then of course I can power it off. Um, so I can run this guy and turn it off. Okay. So yeah, some fun stuff. Um, you can see the results. So again, invalid command, like you can see a little bit what this looks like. If you don't do the right thing, like it's like, oh, if you try doing something like power, you know, over 9,000, it doesn't work, right? So, okay. So cool, you're like, oh yeah, that's kind of cool. Like, nice. Like, all right, you can control some lights. How's that useful? It's like, well, the nice thing is that you guys can control some lights. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let you guys practice this a little bit. So let me go ahead and share this screen here. And I'm gonna share um, also the actual um, code. So I'm just pulling it up. <laughs> Where are you? There you are. Okay, so now you can see this guy right here. And so this right here is actually uh, Google Colab. Um, which is kind of like a Jupyter notebook, but like for the web. Oops, starting clicking off of it. I'm trying to rearrange my windows a little bit better. Here we go. Okay. So you guys see my group LifeX example up here? Thumbs up, you guys see it? Okay. So what I have here, and this is where like, I'm gonna just block this out later on. This is my secret token. So this is the token that actually you would need to control my house lights. Um, just play with this light for the record. Um, don't play with the rest of my lights. I'm gonna later revoke this. So like later on today, if you try changing my lights, you know, in the middle of the night trying to like scare me, um, it won't work because I'm gonna revoke this token. But for now, you can kind of play around with it before the recording's up. So anyone watching the recording, uh, you can try it, but it's not gonna work. Um, <laughs> but uh, you can actually run this right now. So the way you run this, if you, I sent you guys the link in the chat. If you open this guy right here, you actually click connect and just connect to, uh, hosted runtime, or if you just literally click connect here, it'll connect, you see allocating, connecting, and boom, initializing, connected. So now basically this is like a Jupyter notebook on the web, um, which is pretty convenient. So now what I wanna do is like, okay, if I scroll up to the very top here, I can start running it, just like a normal Jupyter notebook. And I run this token right here. Um, for the record, this is the URL if you guys wanna look at that. I think after the recording, this won't work anymore, but that's okay. Um, and I'm just gonna, I did some extra like commenting out because obviously I removed the, my secrets, like all this extra stuff. So we're just gonna use the token directly. And if I start running this now, for example, valid API, uh, API key, you can still see it should work. There you, go. you can see all the information. Uh, basically it's just literally a notebook I just showed you guys. And if I scroll down here, I just wanna make sure if you just ran all the way from the top, you'd be okay. Um, but I'm just kind of skipping ahead. In this case, better might one, I want this guy here. Oops. So. Oh, I have to, I do have to run this stuff. So I have to actually get the ID, right? I think someone's already playing with it. Yeah, <laughs> good. So you can see the, if you guys are watching uh, right now, um, you can see the light change behind me if you guys are playing around with this. Um, but if I run this stuff now here myself, you can see a little bit, I can turn on the power, right? Um, if I wanted to turn it on, in this case, it's just blue by default. So again, if I put like red, I think some people already started playing around with that, but I change it to red right now. Um, and then of course I can power it off. So yeah, oh good, so I'm gonna turn it to green. All right, so there you go. You can see a little bit like people can kind of put in whatever you want. And if you really wanted to, like while you guys are kind of playing around with that, um, 
I can pull up the documentation and kind of show you like what this would look like. It's like, okay, like I want to control my lights. How do I do this? In this case, LifeX has their API. Um, we're going to look at the HTTP API. We'll talk about the LAN protocol maybe in a second, but you can see, for example, the first thing is like authentication and it tells you, hey, how can you can authenticate it um, like with your API token. And you can see, for example, we can list the lights. And what's really nice is that some documentation will literally show you, hey, this is how you do it in Python. And like literally you can copy this code um, and more or less basically do what you want. And you can see a little bit like what the response looks like. Um, you can do things if anyone wants to play around with it, you can actually do things like the breathe effect. Um, so you can do things like actually make it like, you know, kind of like pulsate and stuff like that and do some fun stuff. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like, the, this is kind of the power of APIs. This is less about like, this directly isn't like data, like you're obviously not getting data about my light, um, but you could, you know, if you had like a warehouse of lights or something like that and the business wants to keep track of like, you know, are these lights, you know, working? Where are the brightnesses and stuff like this? You could do some control and, you know, can go back and forth a little bit of control and also collecting data from this. Um, so that's kind of the idea here. But let's say you're like, okay, like you guys can keep playing with that. I'll just keep it on and you guys can see yourself change the color. Um, but let's say for example, like one thing I had was um, when my twins were born, I wanted to get a little pulse oximeter. Um, is it, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the pulse oximeter. Basically it tells you about um, oxygen level and like your heart rate. And they actually made these for little babies and stuff. And what I wanted to do was like, was like, well, they have this nice app, but like, I would like to like collect this information and like kind of see how they're um, like their heart rates change over time and stuff like that. I thought that would be really interesting. Um, and just other reasons why I wanted to do that. But um, there isn't a direct API. So turns out though, um, first of all, the first thing I do is go on GitHub and go find, hey, like before I, even the babies are born, I'm like, tell me, like, show me how to get this API for this little pulse oximeter. Um, it's called an owlet. And it turns out there was some code that someone kind of put together. And um, for the record, it actually was code that was meant for one child. But since I had twins, um, I had to kind of like make this work. Um, so I'll just show you what, this, what that code looks like right now, because um, I think it's interesting. And then I'll show you guys how I actually implement this to collect data over time on um, a cloud network, in this case, uh, Google Cloud Platform. So let me show up some repositories. I think I can just search for, let's just do it. There we go. So here we go. Is this private? No, it's private. This is what I want. Okay, so this actually came from, oh, I did fork it for a while ago. Okay, this was the original code from this user here, uh, which is a security researcher, but they had made some code for Outlet, um, like for their stuff. And unfortunately at the time they didn't have like working code that would work um, for my instance, because my instance was like, I wanted to work with twins and it didn't work. So, you know, for example, this is when I actually forked it. Um, you can actually see I'm one of the contributors now because I forked it and said, oh, let me make some changes. And then actually say, hey, you know, like you can see if I go back to a pull request, I'm sure it's on here as a closed one. Or is it multiple outlet devices? Yeah. So you can see here, for example, I forked it, made a pull request, say, hey, like, you know, I did this, some changes in here. Would you like to include this in your code? You can see a little bit of my commits in here. And they went ahead and merged that into there. So now actually that's part of their code base. Um, so you can kind of see a little like how this like all ties together. Um, it's like, okay, like, let me go ahead and put this on here. Like, one thing I could do is actually run the code on here, um, like on my computer and just run it continuously to collect information. But I'm like, I don't want my computer to be on 24 seven to collect the data. I would like to have it kind of a little more automated from that. And that's where you can do something like, you know, AWS, uh, Google Cloud Platform to run essentially something for me. Um, in this case, I use something called um, Cloud Functions. And this, for example, is Google, Google Cloud Platform. And so you can see here's like a whole bunch of stuff going on here. And there's a lot of stuff like, you know, like you can get it really into this stuff. Um, but what I'm gonna show you is a little bit, it's like you can see in this case, I have a couple cloud functions, a BigQuery data set, it's actually a SQL data that set. So a non-relation, or sorry, a relational data set um, and cloud functions. And this cloud function actually will run my code. Um, in this case, I run it like however often, I don't even remember how often I run it. And you can actually see a little bit of how often it runs. And this is literally, so you can see um, some metrics for how often it's running. This is kind of like more advanced stuff. Like we don't have to worry about this. But the idea here is like, I essentially put the source right here and I can put the source code in here and say, okay, run this code here. And what this does, we're not going to the whole thing, but basically you can see a little bit, it's like, essentially I'm just getting a session URLs request and say, hey, request from the Owlet server essentially, like data and pull this in and then load it into my own storage system so I can look at his historical data. Um, and you can see a little bit what this looks like. Um, and it can even have like, for example, in this case, um, the load uh, the load API, because the 
API key actually changes frequently, or I have the API change frequently, I can actually say, hey, pull up the API key from this other system so I can automate a lot of these things. Um, so this is kind of like the power of like what APIs can do because like otherwise, like I wouldn't be able to get that data off of my like phone unless I like literally like, you know, like wrote it down or something like that. And like, that's obviously super inefficient. So with that though, I'm able to load it into this um, SQL database. In this case, there's a uh, code for the database itself. It's not public for the record, but you can see here's baby twin records. In this case, it's the authentication codes, which I'm not gonna show right now. Um, but you can see, for example, the outlet data. And this is actually the data right here. It has things like recorded uh, TS, which timestamped, device SN. So there's a device serial number to say what my device is, uh, property name, because it turns out it's not just recording heart rate, but it's also recording heart rate, oximeter, battery levels, all this information. Um, whether they're moving, there's some accelerometer in there. Um, and you can see what the value is and updated that. And so this right here is actually a table that I created, right, for my for what I wanted. In this case, I wanted to record this information. And so I can actually query this. So I can go to the editor and I think I can actually go to one of my past query. So let's do that. So you can see here, I have my SQL query. Get a select star from, and this is the table itself, outlet.data. And you can see as data. And say like where data.record TS between, and this right here basically is just saying like my time between January 24th at 9 p.m. to today, the 25th, 8 a.m. And you can actually pull information and say, oh, and I just want just the property heart rate. And you can see those are my results. Um, however, if I got rid of this, I don't know why it's actually selecting that's being bad. Hmm, weird, okay. But now if I run this, you can actually see all the data coming through. And you can see in this case, it's loading. And you can see here, this is how long it's taking to run. So you kind of want to make sure your query is not running through across the whole data set, right? But you can see here, now you can see things like SOC connection, app active, SOC connection. In this case, um, it, was, it, wasn't, um, it was being charged essentially, so it's not really interesting. But it's, okay, if I really wanted things like interesting, like for example, the heart rate, I can actually pull up the heart rate and pull that up. Oops. I don't know why it's giving me an error on that, but that's okay. And then you can see the results. For example, you can see heart rate. Heart rate zero is because it just wasn't it wasn't on them, so there was no heart rate. But you can see here 126. And you can actually see the by serial number, which is what this is, is actually different because I got two babies. They got different things. And you can see here when it was recorded and then also when it was updated. So you can see a little bit of what this looks like. So like the, this is kind of like the idea of like how you might process things. Now, in some certain situations, this is like literally all the data. In fact, if I go to this data here, you can see the details of it. There's about, it's not that big, it's about a gigabyte large, um, created, you know, May 23rd. So this, this is before the babies were born, um, they were born May 24th. Um, but uh, you can see a little bit of the um, estimated roles, rows, which is definitely not true. It's, it's this 1,000, there is 16 million rows. So you can see a little bit like how much data is on there for the past almost year. Um, so, okay, like I don't want all that. I can, for example, get things just the vitals. In this case, I had things like, you know, I want to just know, are they moving the blood oxygen level, heart rate? And so I can actually use this now and I can actually run, oops, I can run a query, for example, instead of outlet data, I can do outlet data vitals as data. And let's just get rid of this guy because that doesn't exist anymore. And select star, we're gonna limit. Nah, we won't limit, we'll just run this. So it's within this date. So I know it's not gonna go through a huge amount of data. Um, but if I rent this, if I got rid of this, it would go through the past almost years worth, like, eight months of data, so you can see how much. And you can see, for example, in this case, it's not really that interesting because <laughs> they weren't connected and everything like that, but that's okay. But you can see a little bit of like, I'm trying to get something. So it's like, okay, this is not really that interesting because I'm like, all right, I want something that's not zero, right? So I can also say where blood oxygen level, okay, but data. So data dot blood oxygen level uh, greater than zero, right? So I don't want things that are zero. I want things that are better than that. Oh, I know this is a where statement, so I gotta put and. You can see how now I can look at my data. Like, okay, cool. Like there, there, I can see some data right here. In this case, you can see, like for example, if they were moving or not moving. You know, if they were sleeping, for example. And you can expect like closer into this is UTC time, so it's a little off. Like maybe like what I would expect. Um, but if I wanted, for example, to go like, oh, let me just go like 4 a.m. You can see a little bit what that looks like. 
So you can see like now I can quickly pull up data, you know, of what I want. And this is kind of co combining like the APIs and like the SQL that we learned and actually putting this together. Um, and this is how you can actually make it useful and then pull this data like, you know, for example, for GCP in a lot of places, I can actually save these results and I can actually save them as a CSV here. So I can actually download that and then explore it with pandas and whatnot. If I didn't want to pull it directly, but you could also, for the record, you could use um, a Python library to directly connect to the SQL server. In this case, it's called um, BigQuery in um, GCP, but you can connect to BigQuery and actually uh, basically directly pull from the server and do stuff with it. So yeah, that's kind of the idea here. Um, so I just want to show you guys a little bit like how that all connects together. Um, any questions or comments? Yeah, I have one question. Mm -hmm. So this Google Cloud, basically, so is this a free, is, is, is it free to like, like this or do, are you like, or is it your real business or what? Well, I'm, I'm kind of a little curious here. Yeah, so first of all, you can do some things for free, but other things cost a lot more than free. Um, the good thing is, is that if you're doing like a little project like this, like um, I actually have some Google Cloud credits from before, but like, even if I didn't have that, this like literally like this whole system running. And I think in this case, if I look at my function, um, I think this literally runs like every second. Um, like not, sorry, not every second, every 10 seconds. Or no, sorry, I, I'm wrong. It runs every minute and then it runs every, um, 10 seconds within that minute. So like even running at that frequency, um, this costs like about a dollar, dollar fifty per month, um, which is like pretty wow. small um, <laughs> in that case. But obviously you can, like if you don't know what you're doing, you can easily run a huge thing. Um, thing. And the reason why this is so much cheaper is because um, if anyone's done any like HTML web, web server stuff, um, I don't have to spin up a server I can do something called uh, a cloud function. Um, that's what this uh, cloud function is. And that's equivalent to AWS's um, uh, Lambda, if you guys are familiar with, if you guys look into AWS uh, Lambda, they're kind of equivalent to each other. And basically it just runs on specific moments. Um, and that could be from an external, another API actually saying, hey, something has changed, run this on Google Cloud Platform or the equivalent be AWS's Lambda run this thing and then run that, which ends up being a lot cheaper than having a dedicated server that's running 24 um, seven. So yeah, but overall it's, you can actually do, for example, if I look up a uh, GCP free tier, there's actually quite a lot of things that you can do for free. Um, like all of this stuff, basically 2 million requests per month. Like, oh, we won't, we won't charge you for the first 2 million requests. Um, as you can kind of see, you're probably not going to hit 2 million requests as a like little personal project. Um, and there's extra things like, for example, five gigs a month of standard storage and all that stuff. Um, Google Cloud Functions, 2 million inv invocations per month. So like, there's actually quite a lot you can do with the free tier. And it used to be, um, they gave you $300 of free credit um, to do stuff. So one thing I'd say is, um, as we get closer to the graduation um, and doing your capstone, this might be useful to have. It used to be $300 a month or 300 credit for a year. I believe now they've changed it to like the first 90 days. Um, I'm trying to see where exactly that comes up, but. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's for the first 90 days. Yeah, it used to be for like the first year and then like sometime last year they changed it to the first 90 days. But this is actually really useful. Like, you know, you can kind of think that's three months worth of like you playing around with um, a cloud, cloud service, which is what this is. Uh, you can play around with the cloud for like three months essentially. Um, I, you probably find it hard to hit $300 unless you're running like um, making prediction models and stuff. And you can actually run your um, machine learning, deep learning stuff on here if you wanted to. I like to recommend people this like GCP for students because they give you that free credit versus AWS. You might be able to find some things out there, but it's like maybe $20, which it's like, oh, it's not, it's not like you can still do a lot with it, but I'm like $300 gives you a lot of breathing room where you can like accidentally run something for 24 hours for like the first week and like, oops, and you'll be okay. Yeah. I'll send this on the chat too, if you guys are curious. But I would recommend if you guys are curious about this, do not, uh, like I would recommend doing it like later on, like as we get past phase three, just so you have a little more time to play around with it. Because as you guys can probably guess, we learned a whole lot really quickly and I would, you know, that way you can do it after you get close to graduation. Cool, any other questions?
whether about this or APIs or playing around with this light. That's cool. Thanks for showing us your uh, little project there. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think it's fun. I who else? Who else am I going to brag it to? I, I can talk. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can. Uh, I tell my wife about it and stuff like that, and she's like, "That's cool." I'm just like, "But I don't really understand what's going on." So this this is really just for me, like for the, you guys to uh, <laughs> show off to you guys. Um, but you can see there's a whole lot of stuff going on here. For example, like this is more like data engineering kind of stuff. But there's something, for example, cloud schedulers. Um, there's also things like PubSub, which is actually the thing that's controlling this. So you can see a little bit, kind of show you guys a little bit what this does. There's actually like, for example, the load API. This is the thing that's actually controlling everything. And it basically is like, this is running every minute saying, hey, send a message out and then it does something, but it could be a whole bunch of different stuff. But um, yeah, but you can see like, if you get like, this is where I like to share these kind of things because sometimes the APIs that we kind of share, it's like, oh, they feel very, like technical and it's like, oh, this is actually how we can do something. Like for example, control lights or, you know, pull data in for some project that you want. Um, there are things like if you had like a Tesla, there's like a Tesla unofficial API. Um, and you can actually like do certain things. For example, you can make it honk if you wanted to or pull up like where it is located or pull up, you know, how much charge it has and stuff like this. Um, so yeah, APIs can be a lot of fun, um, but yeah. But for the project, for the record, you probably don't have to use an API directly. Um, cool. All right. Well, then I'll stop it here then, unless anyone else had any questions or comments, um, whether about using APIs or anything like that. No? Okay, I'll stop recording here then.